After a short humanitarian ceasefire to facilitate hostage release in Gaza, Israel has been back on the attack since December 1st. The Israeli Defense Force is advancing slowly, leaving a wake of destruction behind it. The humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza has only worsened, as the Israeli airstrikes do not relent and the ground battles have intensified. Welcome to another update on the war in Gaza. This video was sponsored by our kind YouTube members and patrons. Becoming a YouTube member or patron is the best way to support our work, so we're now providing our supporters with exclusive videos to thank them. Join their ranks to watch the Pacific War series, alongside the First Punic War, Sulla's biography, the Italian War of Unification, Risorgimento, the Russo-Japanese War, Albigensian Crusade, History of Prussia, and much more. 80 or so exclusive videos in total. In 2024, YouTube members and patrons will watch series on the Fall of Sparta, the Reconquista, Second Punic War, Spanish War of Succession, and Russian Civil War, and will continue getting early access to all videos, access to an exclusive Discord server, will know our schedule, and vote on future videos. YouTube member and patron support allows us to keep the majority of our videos free in a world where YouTube monetization income is very uneven. If you want to support our work, join their ranks today via the link in the description and pinned comment. Thank you. Before describing the developments on the battlefield, it is important to highlight the difficulty of understanding the exact situation on the ground. As the unifier of Germany, Otto von Bismarck, once said, people never lie so much as after a hunt, during a war, or before an election. We have to rely on the official statements of the IDF and Hamas, which for obvious reasons should be taken with a grain of salt. The Israeli command regularly reports about their advance deep into the urban territory of the Gaza Strip, claiming destruction of the Hamas tunnels and its infrastructure. Most of the videos coming from the IDF are mainly footage of the Israeli troops and vehicles moving somewhere on the battlefield, or footage of targeting individuals and buildings claimed to be Hamas operatives. In turn, Hamas frequently talks about the destruction of IDF vehicles and ambushes against Israeli personnel. To be fair, we see regular videos of fighters of Hamas and other groups targeting Israeli tanks and armored vehicles posted by pro-Palestine profiles on social media, but most of these videos end right when the hit happens, making it difficult to ascertain whether the targeted vehicle had been destroyed, damaged or survived. In comparison, in the war in Ukraine, both sides regularly post videos clearly demonstrating the destruction of equipment or the killing of personnel but we still have enough data to understand what is going on on the battlefield. As soon as the ceasefire ended, Israel restarted airstrikes on the Gaza Strip. According to the IDF, immediately after the ceasefire, it struck some 200 targets before recommencing its ground assault. Some of the airstrikes hit Khan Yunis and Rafah in the southern Gaza Strip, which was not targeted as much as North Gaza in the initial phase of the war. It was a sign of things to come. On December 2nd, the Israeli ground forces started moving on the central Salah ad Din road towards Khan Yunis. The IDF chief of staff, Lieutenant General Halevi, confirmed the start of the Israeli ground assault on the south, as did Hamas and the Islamic Jihad, as clashes were reported on the northeastern outskirts of Khan Yunis. Simultaneously, the IDF continued its offensive operations in Gaza City and North Gaza. On December 4th, they demolished the Palace of Justice, which housed the main judicial structures of the Gazan government. Also, the IDF command claimed that they had completed the encirclement of Jabalia, as the 551st Brigade and the Shayatet 13 Commando Unit captured the northern part of this refugee camp. Simultaneous offensive operations in different areas of Gaza, along with the previously employed offensive tactics, indicate the IDF's intention is to isolate sectors one by one prevent any reinforcements from coming to the area, and then gradually destroy the fighting potential of Hamas in these areas without much regard for collateral damage. This approach decreases the effectiveness of the guerrilla tactics of Hamas, but leads to significant civilian casualties. On December 6th, the Israeli military command stated that the 98th Division was conducting offensive operations in the Khan Yunis sector. They claimed that Khan Yunis was encircled after the IDF broke through the defenses of Hamas's Khan Yunis Brigade. The Israeli army has also reportedly advanced deeper inside the city, reaching the Bani Sahela suburb and conducting raids on Hamas infrastructure. A day later, the 7th Armored Brigade of the IDF claimed to destroy the main outpost of the Deir al-Bala battalion of Hamas in this sector. 
Along with progressing in the south, the IDF continued advancing in North Gaza too. On December 8th, a battle between Hamas and the elite Lotar unit of the IDF and the 188th Armoured Brigade took place in a school in the Shajaya neighborhood of Gaza City. Also battles in the Jabalia refugee camp led to the surrender of several Hamas fighters, according to the IDF spokesperson Daniel Hagari. It is not entirely clear how many of the people shown laying their weapons down without their shirts on are actually Hamas members. Throughout December, several videos and photos depicting supposed Hamas fighters laying down arms spread on social media, but pro-Palestinian accounts claim that at least some of them were civilians. On December 10th, the IDF showed footage of a tunnel below the recently captured Palestine Square in Gaza City. They claimed that this tunnel had a connection to the Al-Shifa hospital, which was a site of heavy fighting earlier. In the following days, the Israeli army made progress in Beit Lahir, but the heaviest battles were taking place in the Shajaya neighborhood. On December 12th, the IDF received one of the heaviest blows since the start of the invasion, as 10 Israeli soldiers were ambushed and killed by Hamas. Reports from both sides indicated fierce fighting in Shijaya in this period, and the IDF units may have been under intense pressure in this sector. This may be one of the causes of the unintended killing of three Israeli hostages by Israeli soldiers on December 16th. The IDF investigation noted that all three hostages were shirtless, and one of them was carrying a stick with a white cloth, depicting a white flag. Israeli soldiers thought that it was a trap attempted by Hamas, thus they opened fire, killing these hostages. In the meantime, the Israeli army continued to advance in other sectors gradually. After heavy shelling, they stormed and captured the Kamal Adwan hospital in Beit Lahir. Almost 70 people were arrested under accusations of relations with Hamas, including medical workers and the hospital director. On December 19th, the IDF captured the al Oda hospital, arresting a few hundred people. On the same day, the commander of the 162nd Division, Cohen, declared victory in Jabalia. Two days later, a similar statement was made regarding Shajaya. The 36th Division claimed that they managed to establish a complete operational control over Shajaya, declaring the destruction of core capabilities of Hamas in this district of Gaza City. By late December, the IDF started to mostly focus on operations in central and south Gaza, asserting that there was only a single Hamas battalion in the north remaining. The IDF reported fighting with this battalion in the Daraj and Tufa neighborhoods of Gaza City on December 25th. Two days later, the Israeli army entered the Gaza Strip from another axis in the south. They launched a ground assault in Kuzaar on the outskirts of Khan Yunis. On December 31st, five Israeli brigades targeting the north withdrew, claiming victory due to the decrease of rocket attacks by Hamas on Israel from there. But since then, rockets have been launched from this area, so the level of the IDF's control over it is unclear, even though the IDF spokesman, Rear Admiral Hagari, claimed complete destruction of the Hamas military infrastructure there. On January 2nd, the Israeli military declared the capture of the eastern outpost of Hamas in the Sheikh Ridwan neighborhood, consisting of 37 buildings. According to the IDF, the eastern outpost served as both a Hamas stronghold in Gaza City and its command and control center. Heavy fighting was also reported in Jabalia and Khan Yunis. During this period, the IDF also regularly posted videos of tunnels they have revealed as reported about their destruction. They showed footage of a tunnel under the Rantisi Hospital and stated they have destroyed the tunnel network under the Al Shifa Hospital. As of early January, Hamas and other Palestinian groups in Gaza have not been able to prevent Israel's methodic advance in the Gaza Strip. We have seen much footage of the capture of Hamas weapon caches, and it is clear that the organization's military potential has been significantly damaged since the start of the invasion. But the information available does not make it clear to what extent exactly has Hamas's combat potential actually weakened. They still attempt regular ambushes using their tunnel network, buildings that have not been destroyed yet, and ruins of those destroyed. And some of them are quite painful for the IDF, like the ambush on December 12th. There are many videos showing Hamas or Islamic Jihad fighters shooting at the IDF's Merkava tanks and Nama armored personnel carriers from point-blank range, often firing at them with two or three Yasin or other anti-tank guns. 
but it is reported that these anti-tank guns are not powerful enough to pierce the thick armor of Makava or Nama, which are also equipped with trophy defense systems, and in many cases, Israeli vehicles remained operational after being struck. Still, according to the Amada Rota blog, which is documenting equipment losses on both sides based on open sources, the Palestinians have been able to destroy six Makava tanks and damage another 25. The blog also reports that Hamas so far has not been able to destroy any Nama armored personnel carriers, damaging only 10 since the start of the war, along with destroying six other armored personnel carriers of the IDF. Different sources report that Israel has some 2,200 tanks, and even though the IDF's tank and APC losses may actually be higher, since it is impossible to get visual confirmation for all destroyed and damaged tanks, they are unlikely to be that much higher, as Hamas tries to report all its successful operations. A few dozen destroyed and damaged tanks and APCs are painful for the IDF, but not at the level to change the course of the war. This has enabled Israeli armored vehicles to continue operating in the urban setting without much infantry cover, but Hamas ambushes remain a problem for the Israeli infantry, as evidenced by the December 12th ambush. As of January 7th, the Israeli military has reported the death of 176 soldiers in Gaza, but many analysts claim that the actual number is higher. Official casualty numbers in wars are rarely accurate. Hamas uses tunnels for ambushes, and possibly for transportation of weapons and sheltering during airstrikes, but they have yet to succeed in forcing the IDF to take the fight into the tunnels. In December and January, the IDF has been regularly reporting about the detection and destruction of Hamas tunnels, giving a glimpse of how they look in some videos. The IDF uses different tactics to make them unusable for Hamas. The most obvious is destroying them from the air. The IDF Air Force has been bombing civilian areas in Gaza, mostly in the north, under the pretext of destruction of Hamas tunnel networks, which are often found under these civilian areas. The IDF has been sealing tunnel shafts and setting explosives inside tunnels to prevent Hamas from using them. There have been reports about the use of seawater to flood tunnels, and in this period we finally saw evidence of this tactic. How effective is this tactic? One has to be cognizant of the fact that not all tunnels are equipped with advanced ventilation and filtration systems. Thus, flooding tunnels can be effective against tunnels lacking these systems. The extent of installation of proper ventilation and filtration systems in Hamas tunnels is unknown, as is the level of potential damage to more advanced tunnels. The IDF has claimed to have found 1,500 tunnel shafts since the start of the war, and reported the destruction of hundreds of them. On December 17th, the IDF command invited journalists to see what they called the largest Hamas tunnel near the Erez border crossing. At the start of the invasion, both sides reported about an ambush by Hamas near Erez, which was probably carried out through this tunnel. One of the shafts of the tunnel, which is 50 meters deep in some areas and wide enough to drive vehicles, was found a few hundred meters away from the Erez crossing, which may have been used in the October 7th attack. According to the IDF, the tunnel has several branches and junctions, equipped with a plumbing system, electricity, communication lines and blast doors. On December 20th, the IDF released another video of a tunnel in Gaza City, saying that this tunnel was a component of a larger network in the heart of the city. The IDF spokesman Hagari claimed that, from this infrastructure they could move and spread out across the strip. From the heart of Gaza City, they could go to Shifa Hospital, and from there take an ambulance as a taxi southward, and come back to Shifa, enter the network, move northward towards the Rantisi Hospital area. Both hospitals were a site of heavy fighting in November, for which Israel was strongly condemned. We will likely see more airstrikes in civilian areas to destroy the Hamas tunnel network, which will continue causing death and suffering for ordinary civilians, along with more footage of tunnels which will give us a better understanding of its scope and how it may impact the war in the near future. Hamas is going to continue using its tunnels and military infrastructure built up for years to make the Israeli ground assault and occupation of the Gaza Strip as costly as possible. So the IDF is advancing, but the resistance by Hamas and groups in Gaza is quite fierce and heavy as expected. The war in Gaza has not escalated into a major regional conflict yet, but the risk is still there. Even though there is no regional war going on, an asymmetric conflict is brewing between the United States and the Houthis of Yemen in the Red Sea, while shelling between Israel and Hezbollah on the Lebanese border has not stopped either. 
In December, the Houthi movement, also known as the Ansar Allah organization, continued targeting military and trade vessels in the Red Sea. At least 24 commercial and military vessels have been attacked by them since mid-November. The Houthis are causing disruption to the trade route through the Suez Canal and the Bab el-Mandeb Straits, which carries 12% of global trade and 30% of global container traffic. In the first Houthi attacks, the United States were content with defending this region, but the increasing number of these attacks and the risk they cause for global trade, along with Israeli pressure, have prompted the White House to act more decisively. Netanyahu reportedly told Biden that Israel would act against the Houthis if the United States refused to do so. Indeed, Houthi attacks on merchant vessels have been harming Israel. For instance, the Israeli port of Eilat has seen its monthly revenues decrease by more than 80% due to the refusal of logistics companies to travel through the Red Sea. The Houthis stated that they only targeted vessels traveling to Israeli ports, but even if that is the case, their actions have caused disruption of the overall trade through the Red Sea. Hence, on December 18th, US Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin announced the creation of the Operation Prosperity Guardian Coalition consisting of the USA, UK, Canada, France, Italy, Netherlands, Norway, Spain, Seychelles and Bahrain, with the protection of vessels in the Red Sea as their stated goal. But only five days later, this coalition collapsed, as France, Spain and Italy withdrew from it, stating they would conduct maritime operations only under NATO or the EU's auspices, not the USA. For the first time since the start of the war, the United States and the Houthis clashed directly on December 31st when American helicopters sunk three Houthi boats which were attacking a commercial container. On January 3rd, the United States and 13 of its allies, including Britain, Canada, Germany and Italy, sent an ultimatum to the Houthis, demanding they stop attacks on commercial vessels. The United States has the largest navy in the world, and one of the cornerstones of its status as the sole superpower in the world relies on its ability to protect global trade in the oceans. According to Bloomberg, as of late December, shipping traffic through the Red Sea has decreased by 40% since the start of the war, and the United States is desperately looking for a solution to this problem without being dragged into another conflict in the Middle East directly. To make matters more complicated, the Iranian warship Al Bors entered the Red Sea in early January. Regular shelling along the Lebanese border between the IDF and Hezbollah has continued in this period. But as Israel is getting more confident in Gaza, knowing that Hezbollah is most probably not going to intervene, they have started making their intentions regarding their standoff with Hezbollah clearer. On December 6th, Israeli Defense Minister Gallant stated that Israel will push Hezbollah beyond the Latani River in South Lebanon, and will use force if necessary in order to protect its civilians living in the border areas. But Israel also wants to make clear that their fight is not with Lebanon but with Hezbollah. On December 6th, a Lebanese soldier was killed by Israeli shelling, but somewhat unexpectedly, the IDF made an official statement expressing regret. Israel also did not take responsibility for the airstrike killing a senior Hamas official, Saleh al aruri in Beirut, which was the second attack of this sort after the killing of a senior Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps commander, Reza Moussaoui, in Damascus. While a ground assault on Hezbollah does not appear likely at the stage when the IDF is fighting a difficult war in Gaza, these are signals that they may take more resolute actions against Hezbollah once they get firm control over Gaza. This is particularly true after the destruction of the Israeli air traffic control base on Mount Meron by Hezbollah. The tension between the sides has risen. The IDF invaded Lebanon to fight Hezbollah in 2006, but the outcome was not what Israel had hoped for. Moreover, another war in the Middle East after Gaza would cause a massive international outcry, which Israel would have to take into consideration at some point, bearing in mind the dwindling international support to its invasion of Gaza. A perfect representation of Israel's international reputation is the South African submission of an application to the International Court of Justice against Israel on December 29th, accusing them of genocide against Palestinians in Gaza. Despite increased condemnation of Israel's actions in Gaza, the United States continues to back Israel, which has been costly for its global reputation. Along with diplomatic support, the Biden administration has provided military supplies in the form of artillery shells and ammunition for Merkava tanks as well.
On December 12th, the United States once again rejected the UN General Assembly resolution calling for the immediate ceasefire and release of all hostages. But behind the scenes, the Biden administration has been pushing Israel to scale down its operations in Gaza. The National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan told the Israeli media that he held constructive talks with Netanyahu, prompting Israel to use more precise targeting in Gaza, while Biden called on Israel to be focused on how to save civilian lives. The Biden administration clearly understands the repercussions of unequivocal support to this globally unpopular military operation in Gaza and is pushing Netanyahu to act with restraint. It has not worked so far. The Israeli Defense Minister Gallant assured he was listening to the American concerns while adding a tongue-in-cheek remark, we will find a way to help the Americans help us. But clearly, statements of the most radical Israeli ministers, like Smotrich and Ben Gvir, calling for relocation, also known as ethnic cleansing, of Palestinians from Gaza, further complicates the situation for the Biden administration. The US State Department has officially condemned these statements, calling them inflammatory and irresponsible. In general, the lack of clarity in connection with Israel's post-war plan for Gaza continues. Aforementioned statements, along with the leaked plans of the Israeli government to displace Palestinians from Gaza, were contradicted by the Defense Minister Gallant's promise that Israel does not intend to administer Gaza after the war, claiming that Palestinians will be in charge when the fighting stops. The catastrophic war causing immense civilian suffering in Gaza continues. The airstrikes, like the one in the al Maghazi refugee camp, which killed 86 Palestinians, and the ground assault, has led to the deaths of more than 20,000 Palestinians, according to official figures from the local authorities. The scale of destruction in the Gaza Strip is massive, and now the IDF has included South Gaza as its target too. Civilians are trapped in the besieged enclave with nowhere to go, as Egypt does not intend to let Palestinians migrate into their country while the territory of airstrikes indicates that nowhere is really safe for the people of Gaza. The situation will likely only get worse, as Gallant has already told Sullivan that the war in Gaza will take more than several months, indicating that Israel has no intention to stop at this point. We will continue talking about this conflict in the coming weeks, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button. Please consider liking, subscribing, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Recently, we have started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive content. Consider joining their ranks via the link in the description or button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our private Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.